All right. <clears throat> now, I'm going to take a few talkbacks or questions or thoughts that you have. Anybody have anything for me? I always love it when everybody's discussing things, except I want to be in your group. Yes, ma'am. What is my position on women as pastors? I don't, ha I don't hear the last part. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh. oh, brother. I didn't want to get on a microphone. Your position, as you see in Scripture, as women, as pastors, as leaders of churches okay. in the pulpit. That is a very, very well-phrased question <clears throat> because what you have separated out is that there is a gift of the spirit which is pastoring or shepherding and I think that the gifts are given to men and women without discrimination according to gender so I would say that um, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about what my gifts are because I, cause I don't know I mean I can make some guesses but you know, God doesn't just use you in your gifts. Sometimes he doesn't use your gift except three times in your life or whatever. So to be obedient just to whatever he puts in your place, if you don't like it or not, is what I think is important. Um, <clears throat> but I would say that I probably have some pastoring or shepherding gifts. And um, so there's the gift. Um, um, pastor, shepherd, same word, same, same function. And so... Um, Probably if you have someone that you can think in this room that would have, you know, she's your go-to take care of um, person, would likely have some pastoring or shepherding gifts. Um, so, but that's not the office. So in our church ecclesial structure, what I was referring to earlier is um, the, the way, I, I don't know that much about your church, but Typically, in the evangelical church and, and free churches, you have a pastoral staff, you have an elder board, pastors, you may have deacons. Sometimes in our church, in our free church in Rockford, it was a council. I don't know if they ever changed the name because they recognized that that wasn't the biblical term. But we had elders, pastors, council members, which were deacons. And then you have lay leaders and all that. So I think what you're referring to is a pastor elder. And so, um, thank you for starting with the hardest question in the book. <laughs> this, is a question, this is a question people ask where they go, I'm going to put her over here or over here? <laughs> over here, I ain't going to listen to nothing else she says. Over here, <laughs> maybe. Um, so, I, um, I have studied this deeply, and um, obviously, and so, um, I would say that for elders in a church, I see that in the structure that Paul reaffirms over and over, both in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, there is uh, the passages that talk about elders are very male in their sound. And so um, I understand people who see it differently, but I'll tell you how I see it by reading from um, Titus 1, if my, <laughs> there, um, and, sorry, I've got so much stuff in my Bible, any, any of the rest of you use your Bible as like your filing cabinet, and I'm looking for Titus, and my Bible's too sticky, okay, so I'm going to read to you. Titus 1, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and what remains, set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, namely, if any man is above reproach, and that is male, that, that man is, you know, it's not humankind, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, 
not pugnacious. Do you not love that word? Every time I read this passage, I think we should use pugnacious more often. But not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. So that is a description of an elder that I feel I cannot get away from the fact that it is directed towards a man. And so I feel very comfortable saying that an elder of a church should be a man. And, um, and I think that the, the task that is in 1, 1 Timothy 3 that elders um, are tasked with too is um, setting forth the doctrine of the church. So I think that elders have a great deal to do with deciding what is doctrinally true and that I see that as elders having the function of deciding doctrine. Well, for the most part, doctrine's been settled. We've just had council after council. Doctrine is settled. Most elder boards don't sit around and talk about doctrine. They talk about church polity. They talk about the calendar. They talk about church discipline issues and things like that. And so I feel very comfortable seeing women in positions that are interacting in ways that there is co-laboring with the leaders of the church who are male. I feel like there is a place where there is work that is done on an elder basis. And I would say that a pastor, a senior pastor is, a, is um, is an elder, so an elder board. I like the plurality of elders, and of which the senior pastor would be one. Um, but I also feel very comfortable, boy, you asked me a deep question. I also feel very comfortable with having women who are pastors on staff. Not every pastor is an elder. So my, fa my father, my husband was on the staff of three different churches, and he was never an elder. So I feel very comfortable having women who um, structure in a way that there is leadership and recognized leadership that serves the church in ways that is shepherding and contributing to the work and co-laboring together and doing that in a way where we really don't need to care what we call them. Like in some churches, it's director or coordinator or pastor. So I've seen ministry of women people who are directors of women's ministry, coordinators or pastors. And so we get in a wad and when we do that, what we're doing is we're vying for power in a way that is self-promoting. So I think a humble servant doesn't care what they're called and doesn't care, you know, um, However, if it's a place that there, if, if the difference in title means that there is preference given to men over women, then I think there's a conversation that needs to come in what the title is. So does that make sense? Did I, like, now do you have like 45,000 other questions? No, but somebody has, here. and but, yes ma'am. <laughs> it is 11:23, and you have asked a question that could plunge me right in the depths of a hot <sighs> boiling tub of water. Just a really short version. I think that women can speak in church. Well, here I am. Um, I, I think this is. They didn't hear the question. The question. First Corinthians 14. Women First must be Corinthians silent. 14, 34, and 35 says the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husband at home, for it is improper for women to speak at church. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, when we lift verses out of the passage, um, it can sound devastating to women. I mean, I have, I have um, enough years of experience that I have heard 
I'm not surprised by much anymore. I hear tons of stories. Um, but I have had women who have told me they would not have been able to stand up on the platform. And they would not have been able to stand on the platform and um, say anything. I've had women tell me they could stand on the platform over here and say something, but they would never be allowed to stand over here and say something. And so there's all kinds of ways that we can take that verse and decide what it says. The problem with taking, there's, there's a couple, let me just say to you, if I had time to go straight through that you would love what it says, you would love what it says. But an easy way for me to counter that is to say, well, can we just back up to 1 Corinthians 11? Because if we back up to 1 Corinthians 11, it says, um, here's how a man should pray in the congregation. He, if, um, if a man prays with something on his head, while praying or prophesying, it disgraces his head. And every woman who has on her head, who, who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. So when women are told how they are to pray and how they are to prophesy in the congregation and told how they are supposed to be, it very naturally assumes that they are doing that. So 1 Corinthians 14 cannot mean that women are not ever supposed to do that because Paul has just said in 1 Corinthians 11 how they should do it. And so we're like, Paul, could you get your stuff together, please? <laughs> so let me just, I, I will give you a couple um, I will give you a couple points to consider and then have you go home and read um, 1 Corinthians 14 again. Okay, so you, can, you, have to start at, um, you have to start at the beginning of the chapter. If you really go back to 1 Corinthians 11, and so we already know that Paul says when a woman prays and a woman prophesies in the congregation, she should do it this way. He already says that, so that's what we already know. There were always women who were prophetesses in the Old Testament and the New Testament, so we know that women speak for God. And if you look at Huldah, um, and I always say she's in, I think, in Kings and Chronicles, Huldah is a prophetess that the King Josiah sent all of his top men to go ask her what the Lord says about something. And in that passage, um, she three times says, thus saith the Lord to the men who are the leaders of the country that went back to talk to King Josiah. There have always been women who have prophesied, always, who have spoken for the Lord. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, this is how you do it. And then he goes straight into 1 Corinthians 13 where he talks about love. In other words, he knows that part of what he's doing is correcting a mess that's in the church. I mean, 1 Corinthians is all about Paul saying, you people know how to do church, you need to know how to do church, and by the way, what you need to do is focus on the crucified Christ. And now you need to take care of all this mess. I mean, you've got uh, somebody sleeping with his father's wife, you've got all kinds of sin all through 1 Corinthians, like, he, he addresses like 10 huge things. And then he's trying to tell them how to be the church. So 1 Corinthians 11 is about order. Women need to dress in a way that is not distracting. My, when I talk to my students about dressing, I'm saying, you need to dress in a way that looks so good without looking so much like you're trying to get attention. You need to dress in such a way that people forget what you wore, but remember who you are. And so Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 11, women, and you need to be modest and you need to, you need to wear the right kind of clothes to represent who you are in Christ. And do things that the main thing you're doing is in love. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 14, so you'll want to start with the first few verses that say, pursue love, which he goes back to talk about the love chapter. Pursue love 
yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. Okay, so every single one of us should be saying, Lord, please give me the gifts that you want me to use to represent you well and to provide for the body of Christ what needs the what you want me to do to fit in to make the body whole, right? So you, you want a gift so you can pursue gifts. Lord Jesus, please give me the gift of, you know, I got people coming over for dinner. Please give me the gift of hospitality just for a minute because I don't know what I'm doing. You know, you want to pursue gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. This is what Paul says, and let me read this again. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And if you will remember in Acts, when the Spirit came, there was a prophecy of Joel in Acts 2 that was fulfilled that says, in those days, I, the Spirit will come, and on your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy. Yes, on your sons and daughters, they will prophesy. And so, um, verse 2, chapter 14. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So what Paul is going to say here is um, that he speaks in a heavenly language. Others speak in a heavy, heavenly language. And when they speak in tongues, nobody in the congregation knows what they're saying. And in all of this chapter, he's saying, um, it, it's really quite stunning. He's, he's telling them, you don't want to want that. You're going to want something else. But the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men to be God, for no one understands but his spirit. He speaks in mysteries. But the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation. So what, what kind of prophecy is he talking about? When I'm standing up here and I am speaking to you and it edifies you and it exhorts you, and there's consolation in it, that's what he's describing as prophecy. So it's, it's speaking forth the word of God, and, and this is what he's saying. And he's saying you want to do that. And so in the beginning part um, of 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is saying you want that, you want to do that. And then he goes through and he says, if somebody's going to speak in tongues, I want you to be silent unless you do it this way. If somebody's going to speak in prophecy, I want you to be silent unless you do it this way. And then he says to women, women, I want you to be silent. If you have a question, ask your husband at home. Okay? So there's instruction that goes to that. And then here's the last verses in chapter 14. If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. And so this is the final verse in chapter 14 that goes back to the first two verses in chapter 14. And this is what Paul says in the final, in the, in the bookend. So he bookends the message. And in chapter, in verse 39, he says, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. What Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians, like, I'm going to get out of this slide for a minute. What Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians is trying to say, this is how the church should, never mind. <laughs> this is how the church should be run in a way that is proper, that is orderly, that is functioning well, that is respectful, that is done in a way that we don't have to be distracted by the order of the church. We can flow well in the order so that our focus is really on the gospel. And so this chapter is about order. And so if women were, um, I don't know if this is exactly the setup there. There's always a new book that says something else about the, what's going on in these chapters. But if the culture that we know was in place, um, was that the women are on one side and the men are on the other. If the women were really curious and are calling over to their husband to ask a question, then that would make sense that Paul says, I, you know, I don't want women. Y'all wait till you get home. Now, so if he's talking to wives who are talking to their husbands, he's talking to wives that doesn't go to all women. 
That, that doesn't apply to all women. Not every woman was married or had a husband that was living. So there's a lot of things in the text that um, uh, we, we question, we think about in the, in the context of the culture. But I would say what helped me the most was to read the book in verses. And also to go back to um, chapter 11 and notice that um, if, if he was saying how to have women pray and prophesy in the service in a way that was orderly and not distracting, he would not, two chapters later, say women can't say anything in church. Is that helpful? I actually see I love that now. I love chapter 14 after I've, I did my study in it. I, I love chapter 14 because it's not what has been so hurtful. It is really so um, logical. It's so logical to me. Because in the rest of the New Testament too, and in the Old Testament, women were praising the Lord. They were active participants. They were not cordoned off in a section where they were not to be as engaged um, as, as the men. So it's been a verse that has hurt a lot of women and therefore hurt a lot of churches. Is there one more question? Easier than that one? <laughs> but thank you so much for asking it. No? All right, then um, let me do one more thing. Where, oh, you do. Am I on? Jocelyn. Um, advice you give to us strong women who are natural born leaders mm -hmm. and our husbands don't want to be leaders. And so, like for me, I have a tendency of leading our marriage. Mm -hmm. So, like, mm -hmm. what do you do with that? Um, I, I think, you know, that is a very good question. Um, and um, it is, um, uh, it, there, is, there are cultural setups all over the world where women um, are um, the, the, the stronger leader and men are not as strong. I have traveled all over the world, and I know in different cultures, that's, that's a setup. And I also know that in our culture, um, there are things that, there are societal setups, I think, that are, um, are setting this as a norm. So one of them is there are more women getting higher education degrees now in America than men. And so, um, as we go forward in the next few years, there are going to be more women with higher education degrees than men. And so, what that also says to me is the strength of the difference in strength. So, um, I had a student ask me this uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and I still think about it. She says, why does the world expect so much for women and the church expects so little? Is that not an interesting question? So I think that's a setup that needs to be answered, and I think it can be answered why that, um, so both in the church and in your home, um, I think that the, when a husband can bless his wife by affirming strong gifts, that's the best setup. So when a husband can say, you go, girl, get it. I remember I was defending my dissertation, and um, my father was in the peanut gallery, and um, and so and so afterwards, he told me that I got a slow start. And he says, "So I'm sitting there going, come on, girl." And now my daddy's in heaven. And every now and again, I remember that he said to me, "Come on, girl." And so if we have men in our life who can look at their women and say, "Come on, girl, do what God says, live full out," then that's a blessing. I also think that that's um, not always the case. And so it is important for a wife to defer to her husband in a way that he feels honored and that he doesn't feel like he can never do what you can do and so he's not gonna try. And so it's really important 
for you to know how to affirm and champion your husband in the ways that he needs to feel honored and respected. Um, and that may mean laying aside your gifts for a while. And it is a submission to the Lord to live in a way that you honor your husband the way you know he needs to be honored and that you entrust your gifts to the Lord and wait for his timing. So just because just we can and we could and we will doesn't mean we should. And it doesn't mean it's our time. So nobody can tell you how to do that because everybody's marriage is different, right? The worst thing you can do is read a book on how to do that because your marriage isn't like the one who wrote the book. I'm telling you, the worst thing you can do is, I always tell my students, read one married book, read one, one book on marriage and then throw it away and study each other. Because if you keep studying those books, you're gonna try to fit your husband into the mold and they're gonna keep changing because everybody has a different thought. But um, so you know and he knows if it's not working. So Bob and I teach a marriage and family class together. And the students always say they like to see how we work together because we're very, very different. If you're going to hear him preach tomorrow, you're going to say he's very, we're very different. Um, and our marriage doesn't work like a lot of people's, but it works for us. And we know when it's not working for us. And it's our job to fix it so it does work for us so that we are honoring each other in the way we need to be honored. But sometimes that means um, stepping back. You, do, you would do that for somebody else, you know, so you can do it for your husband too if that's what he calls, but um, it's really wonderful when, you know, when the Lord brings husbands who aren't there yet to the place where they can say to their wife, you go girl. So, okay, all right, let me, um, I've got 20 minutes left. I wanna just um, show you one more passage that I think is, um, it's just a wonderful passage that I think oftentimes gets, I'm going to clean out my Bible this afternoon. <laughs> I've just decided. Um, uh, this passage gets misunderstood. I use my computer Bible so often, you know, that I for forgot that I've got so much stuff in here. Okay. In, in Philippians, there's a, a, a two verses that often get misunderstood in Philippians that I think are just lovely. Um, and so if you, uh, I remember as um, on the ministry to women board at our church, it sort of was a joke with us. Like when we would sit down and we would um, be planning out the next year of Bible studies we always were like, well, if we don't know what to do, well, we do Philippians. Everybody does Philippians. Um, and why not? It's a great book. So um, you've studied Philippians 40 or 50 times. Um, you know that what Paul was talking about was that the church had something going on that they were not in unity. And um, many of you will remember that the church started in Philippi when Paul came to Philippi and there was no synagogue in Philippi. This is in Acts 16, and there was no synagogue, which meant there were not enough um, Jews. There were not at least 10 Jews to have a synagogue. And so on the Sabbath, he went around in Philippi looking for somebody to worship with, and he came upon a group of women who were praying on, on the river, by the river. Um, I have been there. I can see this little spot where they say, it may have been here. And you know, it, you know it wasn't, but you can imagine it. But anyway, he came upon the women, and in that moment, um, the Lord revealed himself to Lydia. Lydia became a Christian, and then Paul came and stayed with Lydia. The, the church was birthed there. So what we do know about the church in Philippi was that Lydia was the first Christian, and the women who were with her were part of the birth of this church. And so as time has gone on, Paul is now writing to the church in Philippi and he's saying, you know, you people need to be in unity. And so that's the theme of the book. So in chapter four, after he has talked about this for a while, in chapter four he says this, 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. Don't you love that? Paul often talks about churches and ones that he has been part of um, uh, teaching them. He just loves them so much, and he loves this church. I mean, he stayed with Lydia for quite some time. My joy and my crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So he can't help but say, in my joy and my crown, and then my beloved. Verse 2 says this, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. I don't know about you, I've heard sermons on this. Well, you know those women, they can never get along. This is, this is like my church, the women are at each other. I have heard, have y'all heard sermon after sermon on that? I have heard sermon after sermon on this. When, I remember when I started to study this, to teach on it, and I looked in an old Bible program that I have that has a lot of old commentaries. Every single one had the same kind of title that it was like contentious women or problem women in the church and all that. I'm like, I don't accept that. Um, but I was curious. I mean, obvious is like these women had a problem with each other. Taking a deep dive into this passage to start at the last clause of verse 3 it says these are women whose names are in the book of life so he Paul is assuring them these are believing women let us not forget these are believing women there's that starting back up at verse 2 I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche it's not I urge Yodia and Syntyche who's first hmm that must be the problem woman. No, he urges both in the way that he is saying that, you know, this is something that they both got. There's, there's trouble. This is something with both of them. It's not just one of them. It's both of them. There's something with both of them. There's a problem. And he says, I urge you to live in harmony in the Lord. And understanding um, what Philippians is about, um, with him wanting unity in this church, um, there is a sense that the disunity of Euodia and Syntyche is affecting the whole church. These are women that he's writing their names in a letter so the whole church hears it. He's writing his, their names in a letter and he's pleading with them to be unified. I urge you to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion. And so now Paul is asking for help from somebody in the church. We don't know who this is. From somebody in the church. So it is assumed that he's like asking um, one of the the elders or leaders of the church. I urge you, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers. What Paul is saying here is these women are my fellow workers in the gospel. They have co-labored with me in the gospel. So, in this passage, Paul is identifying Euodia and Syntyche as co-laborers of the gospel with him and the brothers. We know that Lydia had a lot of influence in this church. If we want to understand men and women working together in the church, we can take this passage and say, you know what, Paul, loves these women because he co-labored with them in the cause of Christ. They co-labored with other leaders in the cause of Christ. Here's a picture of co-laboring together. And it makes us think back on Romans 16, where Paul, in this passage, talks about um, people in Rome, in the Church of Rome, that he wants to greet in the church. And he starts out 
by saying, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant in the church which is in Chantria. And I will tell you that word servant is interestingly translated because in the Greek it is a proper name of a proper position and servant every place else. The word every other place in scripture is translated deacon. Phoebe is a deacon with some position in the church and she's also the one that carried the letter to the church in Rome, which would have meant that if there were questions about what Paul meant, she would have been the one to answer them. And so he starts out and talks about Phoebe, and then he goes on further, and he greets 10 women. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers. Verse six, greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are outstanding among the apostles. So what I think is that Paul gives us information in Romans 16. He gives us information in a passage that I think has sadly been misunderstood about Yodi and Syntyche. He models all through the church the same thing that our Lord modeled too when our Lord gave the message of the gospel to women to declare to others, when our Lord allowed and invited Mary and commended Mary for sitting at his feet in a way so that he could teach her um, the important truths of his message for the world in the way that he, um, in, in the way that he affirmed um, and, and allowed women to travel with him and support him, in, in the way that our Lord did so many things, like with the Samaritan woman, that went beyond the culture of the day and elevated women and was not ashamed to be with them, to teach them, um, and to, to tell the Samaritan woman that he was the Messiah when he had not told his own followers, then they didn't know. And for, um, for, for Martha, when Lazarus died, for him to, to take care of her, and say to her, do you know who I am? And she says to him, yes, Lord, you are the Christ. And we always hear that Peter says that, but do we ever hear that Martha says that? And so there's a way to read scripture the way we have, with the glasses on that we have seen, you know, been looking through. And there's a way to take the glasses off and say, Lord, show me what I haven't seen. And I really believe that it's the intention of God from the beginning to the end for men and women to serve him together, to honor him, to tell the world who the Lord is, and that the world will know by how we also serve him together. Um, and so um, I think there's so much affirming and good. Uh, when, when we talk about uh, the position of um, pastor or elder, that I do believe that that's reserved for men. Um, I think um, I think of the time that um, the disciples um, said to Jesus, um, "Well, um, Jesus, um, I want to be at your right, and my brother, let him be at your left." In other words, we want to have um, a lot of power. We want to be with you in a way that you make us really powerful too. We want to big be hot shots with you. And Jesus says, don't do that. He says, don't lord over like the Gentiles do. I have come to serve and you should serve. And I have come to show you how to be the servant. And so you should take the place as a servant. So all along, God is saying, Jesus is saying to us, God is saying to us, we are, it's, it's our job to serve, not to want the high place, but to take the low place. And because he's, he's the king, he's the one we serve, and, and the way he's organized his church is his business, and um, so we should not be seeking to be more. We should be seeking to live as a servant 
rather than to be the master. And um, so, you know, I think that there's a lot in issues of women in the church where we really want more agency because um, we want to do good for the Lord. I think that there's so much good in this issue of wanting to have agency in place. There's so much good in that. And I would not want anyone, male or female, to not want to have agency to do whatever we can do in the church and in the world for the Lord. I, we, it's, it's important that we want to do stuff and we want, it's important. Um, and so we can't lose that, but we can have that still with the sense, and I will do whatever, wherever, whenever, and I can also do nothing, and I can do something. And so to be satisfied during those times in our life where he asks us to sit still on a shelf, everybody gets to sit still on a shelf. Um, you know, Moses got to go to the wilderness for 40 years. David was anointed, and then he had to sit and wait for a while before he was actually appointed king. So we all get those times, and I think that those are the times where the Lord works stuff out of us. i got four minutes, and I'll tell you one little thing. When, um, when, Bob was, um, when Bob was a youth pastor, I loved being in our church because um, it felt to me like being a pastor's wife was like um, a gift on a silver platter. I felt like I had this um, Im image one time that, that, um, that that gave me entree to do ministry that if I went to another church, I'd have to work for six years before anybody expected to be ministered to for me. But, you know, the first time I stepped inside the door with my husband's on the pastor, people want me to do stuff. And that was, to me, a gift. Some people feel it as a burden, and I understand that, but for me it was a gift. And so I had this lovely, wonderful church that we loved deeply and dearly, and the Lord set it up that we just thrived in ministry there. So then Bob decides, and we decide, um, that then he's going to go be a professor at Moody. And so we were in the same town. We, we thought we'd move, but we eventually didn't. But we needed to go to another church because there wasn't going to be anybody who wanted to come and be a youth pastor after Bob left because everybody would still be looking at Bob. We knew that. So we left and we went to this church. And um, <laughs> this church, um, it, was, it was really hard to break in. I mean, I volunteered for the uh, Ministry to Women board before six months before they ever called me back. Six months before they ever called me back. And we kept going to this Sunday school class, and I kept telling Bob, they are trying to evangelize us. They don't think we're even saved. And, and, and I, was getting, I was getting a little <laughs> about it all. And afterwards, I thought, you know what the problem is? There has never been a church in my life where my daddy or my husband wasn't the pastor. And I expect to get a party when I come to a church. And this church was not giving me a party. <laughs> And then when I realized that, the minute I realized I, I had to go straight into repentance. It was like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that, but I did. But in the process of that, everything that I ever did in ministry was taken away, absolutely everything. And so the first year that Bob was a, a, um, a professor, everything was taken away. I had to um, get a job um, and... Um, we were thinking we were going to move, so I got a job at a, at a Christian bookstore, which is really God's sweetness in my life because I saw all my friends, they would come in. <laughs> so it's like the Lord let me keep up with my friends. But I had this job, and I had not worked up to that point. I had been home with my children. And so there were a lot of things that God, it was like God was poking at my soul. And I remember one night I was, um, I was vacuuming before we closed the store. Well, side note, I had not vacuumed since the first month of my marriage because we lived, that was back when there were shag carpets. Y'all remember? remember? Anybody seen movies with shag carpets? Um, but I could not get the vacuum through the carpet 
when we first got married. I was like, oh gosh, I can't do this. And so Bob started doing it and I just, then we moved and got different carpet, but we never told him that that changed that. So he, he did all the, you know, I was happy. I didn't want to do vacuuming anyway. But so I'm vacuuming thinking, I don't even do this in my own house. And, um, and so I'm doing it and I'm struggling with the Lord. And, um, and this had gone on about a year. So my soul was really entwined in some conflict. And I'm doing this. I'm like, Lord, I don't want to do this. I, I want to do what I, I think you've equipped me. You've called me. You've given me experience. All this stuff. And, and I am not happy. I'm, I don't like this. I am really struggling with you. And, and I didn't know what to do. And I'm just, I don't know what to do. And I heard the Lord as loud as I've ever heard him. Not audibly, just so you know, I'm not like delusional, but I, I heard the Lord say to me, what if this is the only thing I want you to do the rest of your life? Will you do this and praise me? And I, I didn't know what to do with that question. And, and I played it out in my head. What if that's, and I played it out and I'm like, Lord, seeing as you know me better than I know myself, you know that I want to want to say yes. I have the want to want to say yes, but I don't know how much yes I've got in me right now. I've got a little tiny speck, but that, I don't know, Lord, I want to say yes to that. And he said, you need to know that anything I ask you to do is my mercy in your life. Anything. Whatever it is. And I had to, um, I had to sit with that for a while. But I will never, ever, ever forget that whatever it is, whatever God is asking you to do right now, it is his mercy that you get to do one thing for him. It is his mercy that he uses you for anything. It is his mercy that we live, that we breathe. It is his mercy that you are sitting here. It is his mercy to us that there's anything in us that he can use. And I have never forgotten that. Now, I have not always lived in that, but I have never forgotten it. And it is a message from the Lord that helps me when I am in a place and I think I could run circles around the person who's in charge. And I don't mean to be arrogant about that, but you know how that feels. I'm just saying it. And first thing, I know that's not really true. I know it's my own self acting like, acting like I could tell people what to do. <laughs> um, and that's sin. So I've got to deal with that first. But then I come back to it, whatever the Lord asks us to do. And so that the times that I do things where I feel my gifting and my experience converge and it's sweet, it's even sweeter. And he gives us those times. He gives us those times. And so, um, so I guess um, since I'm three minutes over, I'll take two more. I just, what I would say is, you know what, the Lord comes to us in moments like that where he, he supplies what we need to be in tune with his heart. So in the times where we're struggling or the times where we don't get it or the times we wish things weren't the way they were, we can't do it, but the Spirit comes in and strengthens us and gives us joy and soothes our hearts and gives us courage and um, supplies what we need to live in a way that pleases the Lord. These things are too hard for us. You cannot... Um, you can pray to ask the Lord to help you, I think, but you cannot um, do it yourself. You just can't do it yourself. We don't have it within us to live in the way that the Lord wants us to live. But the Spirit is in us. The Spirit is in you. And the Spirit is, so the Spirit is in you individually, but the Spirit is in this church collectively. 
and the Spirit is doing something in this church collectively and doing something in you, and he brings the convergence, and he does that in a way that people look and go, oh, God is in that place. And that's what we pray for. May they see God. May they know who the Lord is. That's what we want. And um, when we don't necessarily know we want that, we ask him to give us the want to want to know do what he wants us to do. So let me pray for you and we can go. Father, I thank you so much for this day and I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you know who we are and that we are needy and that we have all kinds of things in us that we know um, you want to sanctify so that we are more like our Savior Jesus. I thank you so much that in your plan, you, you, um, it is your will that we go from glory to glory and continue to look more and more like Jesus over time. And so I pray that you would help us today to submit to the Spirit's work in our life so that today we will look more like Jesus, so that the world will know that you are God. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.